In this series, we'll be talking to people from nations across the world to send best wishes across the oceans and learn more about how they overcome the challenges in this fast and ever-changing world. Estonia has an ancient culture that stretches back for over a thousand years, but it is only since 1991 that it has achieved a lasting and stable independence. In its time, Estonia has been both independent and ruled over by what we now know as Denmark, Germany, Sweden and Russia. After declaring independence in February 1918, it fought for two years before finally achieving fully recognised independence in 1920. During the Second World War, it was ruled by both Russia and Nazi Germany before it fell under Soviet rule in 1944, where it would remain for most of the next half century. But Estonians maintained a strong sense of identity and a reputation for technical expertise, which came in handy when they were famously able to retune their TVs to watch American shows right under the noses of the Soviet Union at that time. The wall has suddenly become irrelevant. Everything changed in 1989. With the fall of the Soviet Empire, Estonia was set free to realise its potential. The country embraced technology and underwent a digital revolution that has helped make Estonia the fastest growing economy in the EU with one of the highest standards of living in the world. As Covid-19 brings the world to a halt, how is Estonia dealing with the pandemic and what can we share and learn from one another? We speak to Lynn Arvik, who is an IT visionary, pioneer and founding father of Estonia's digital revolution. He is also, amongst many other things, an advisor to governments around the world on digital government. Karen Burns is the CEO and co-founder of another Estonian early stage technology success story, Visery AI. Raymond Brecken, CEO of another small software company who's made Estonia home after growing up in England. And finally, we spoke with Peter Ferry, who is a former senior executive with Microsoft and who now runs his own tech company in Edinburgh called Wallet Services. He's also an honorary consul for Estonia here in Scotland. And we were joined in that discussion by Doug Chapman MP. What has been the Estonian response to, to this pandemic and, and what is life like for, for people across Estonia? It's interesting to see how different uh, cultures have um, managed with the, the kind of lockdown, I think. It's an Estonian only wants to see the smoke from their neighbour's chimney. Okay, So in this part of the world, it's no, isolation is a dream. You know, it's... People want to be distanced. Uh, it's a difficult thing because we are never used to be so close as two meters to anybody. <laughs> I would say that five meters is a good social norm which we have in Estonia. It's almost the only difference is that Scotland is 3D and Estonia is flat. <laughs> it, apart from that, it's the same. You know, it's the same <laughs> amount of forest. It's the same amount of fields. It's yeah. the same number of large cities. Mm -hmm. uh, and a large amount of rural farming and wilderness is the same. It's just Estonia. It's just a flat version, and it's not the uh, lumpy version. Like we've got, yeah, we've got, we've got the hills and mountains. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Sweden is very different, isn't it? So Sweden yeah. is pure common sense and no government intervention. I guess Estonia is kind of halfway, and England is more authoritarian in its in its lockdown. I live in a in a massive tourist hotspot, um, and it is just empty. But the government hasn't said you have to stay indoors. It says you can go out in family groups, or if it's you know uh, work colleagues, you can go out in twos and the, the two meter distance. There's no restriction on driving around Estonia or or being outside in any way other than that. It's common sense. We're such a small country, which means we can do stuff in an agile way. So mm -hmm. really quickly, uh, decisions are implemented in a quite fast way. So once I got back from Dubai, um, mm. as soon as I landed, the airport had 
uh, a stream of teams taking you through basically from um, passport control to sanitizing our luggage ourselves before we were allowed out um, and then further on beyond going home and into uh, quarantine. Uh, the police would phone me and check, not where I was, but to check whether I had food and if there was somebody they could come and, you know, um, I could help reach out to and if it, um, basically they checked whether I was in trouble or not and if they could do anything to help. And they called me twice during the two week period and I think that was really lovely. So they must have done tens of thousands of phone calls wow. uh, to people to make them you know, feel like you really are being looked after. What, what support has there been from government to, to employees? Are they paying some of the wages? What, what's happening with, with that in Estonia? The 70% of your salary is guaranteed uh, uh, even if you don't have a job and that 70% of your salary uh, is conditional to 30% to be still paid by uh, your employer, even if you don't have a job. But there are also a number of new jobs appearing to the market, and especially especially the e-services and uh, digital grocery services. Okay. They are all having an extra demand for the, uh, for the workforce. So we see extremely fast dynamics also taking place on the employment market. And this is something which... Uh, we are working right now, for example, how to motivate people, how to build in the bonus system to the e-learning for the reskilling purposes in the employment market. So there is a shift now in the labor market from people kind of moving more towards these sorts of um, temporary jobs. But the worry is that uh, if you were a, you know, a musician before or you worked in an office, will you actually go and work a field like a tattoo field? How, how, would, how would that even work so that's something that we're still kind of monitoring to see what the impact will be. I was keen to find out more about how Estonia has used its advanced digital economy to manage in the COVID-19 crisis. What has worked really well has been working from home because Estonia is such a digitized country mm -hmm. that we can do everything and anything online. The only thing you can't do online is get married and buy a house. There's always been video call. There's always been uh, remote connection to services. Even 20 years ago, I could work from home on a secure line uh, into a um, into a defence project. Like it, it's no big deal. So there's nothing really that you need to invent to work from home. All the public services in Estonia are still accessible for everybody because all the public services are accessible via internet. I think we are, we are, we are the only country in Europe right now where the court system, for example, works on a regular basis and no court processes have been stopped because you are able to conduct the work in the court also over the internet channels and over the digital means. If you want to create a new company, Mm. In Estonia, you can still do it uh, uh, within a 10 or 15 minutes uh, and to create a company, open a bank account and start acting as a perfectly legitimate company. You don't need to do any paperwork for that. The government has even stretched further with a number of the digital, digital services, for example, an, uh, sick leave uh, uh, announcement uh, which you can do without physically visiting doctor. There isn't anything left that they that, uh, that you can't do digitally that they could add, but it's still far ahead of the clumsy UK's version of it. Um, so it's almost become the norm. Okay, so I can't even begin to imagine how it's a benefit because it's just normal. The only thing we've added is uh, every Friday at four o'clock, we kind of do a video call with the team, drink <laughs> beer and talk about uh, everything else but work. It's clear that Estonia's ability to harness the power of its data-rich systems is helping it deal with this pandemic. Is it, is it published how many people have, have contracted the virus? How many people have sadly lost their lives? How, how, is, how is government dealing with we it? We have public data, open data on a daily basis published out by crisis committee and by health authorities, mm. including also opportunities for data scientists to build up uh, data models and uh, and we are of course thinking uh, about different digital means 
for the for the um, for, for monitoring the the infection process. Mm. But once again, Estonia is a small country, forty-two thousand uh, square kilometers, mm. and size like Netherlands with bit over one million people. So we know a, a lot of each other. We know virtually every pandemic outburst. Only thanks to that digital investment we have made, we are surviving this crisis in a way that we don't lose the access to the core services and capturing data from the digital channels is yeah. something which gives also an opportunity to make an and decisions based on data. How successful ha has Estonia been in terms of protecting the healthcare system? We have been successful in that case. We have been able to pretty accurately model based on the big data analytics uh, the need for the emergency care beds, mm -hmm. also ICOs in the hospital and uh, and we have been all all the time working uh, below the capacity. Like so many in Estonia's digital community, Karen Burns' company is using its expertise in the battle against coronavirus. Okay, so um, I'm the CEO of a company called Visory, and we are a machine learning computer vision company, so working in artific artificial intelligence. Mm. And what we do, we essentially turn, we can turn any camera into a sensor. So we put our algorithms uh, crawling over video and image feeds that come in and then give out data on any object that the algorithm sees. So the real life use cases are mostly around urban analytics and video analytics in an urban context. So, for example, in uh, Tallinn and, um, and some of the cities in Estonia and with the police as well, we can count people, uh, cars, trucks, uh, cyclists. We can look at the trajectory that they travel. And this allows us to basically assess whether there are illegal turns executed on junctions, for example. And we can also um, track intent. So what will happen with the car in the next five to ten seconds um, on its trajectory? Wow. Um, and we've been also monitoring social distancing. So do people actually uh, follow the two plus two rule that we have here? So two people per group, two mm -hmm. meters apart. And uh, we can see that this now has been going down. So people are, like I said, uh, tired of it. Uh, yeah. All the feeds we look at are anonymized. So we don't uh, track or even see number plates or people's faces. So that's no. something that we don't do. Um, so we've been a kind of monitoring the, the crisis response and we are able to give real time data back to local governments, uh, city councils and the police departments on uh, how the measures are um, impacting on real life and giving the kind of data back to them. And with its digital expertise, Estonia has been punching well above its weight in the global battle against COVID-19, as Raymond Brecken explains. The software that my company makes is a, is a tool to help uh, people um, submit ideas and evaluate them. So it's used by hackathons as, um, okay. remotely. Yeah. Uh, it's used by university grant distribution, things like that. It's used by teams of developers to bounce ideas around and to come up with a new product. Uh, the Estonian government plus some other um, hackathon type companies launched uh, Hack, the, Hack the Virus, basically. So Yeah, I saw uh, that on some, on some yeah. of the Estonian well, social media. Yeah, It, it started as um, as purely an Estonian thing. The output is some really interesting and different ways of looking at how to, to cope with the virus. So that's that's kind of how Estonia technology responds. It's like, let's fix it, it's a problem here, let's everyone get on it and evangelize the whole, you know, we're great at technology, so that's what we bring to the world. Let's yeah. like Let's get everyone on it. And it was massive. Everyone in, in Estonia is an entrepreneur. Like, you know, everybody has their little side thing. So uh, give them some massive problem and they're all over it. So that's the kind of culture here. I guess that the, maybe the, some of the worst parts about the um, current crisis have been around some of the political decisions that have been made. Mm -hmm. So Estonia recently, as recently as actually two or three days ago now, uh, voted on a law uh, which um, enabled the government to expel 
anybody uh, who doesn't have a working visa here who's a foreigner. So they've kind of taken advantage of these special measures and this law um, will like, be extended beyond um, the current crisis as well. Okay. So it's quite an insular and to do because we're such a small country, we, we need to harness soft power mm. a lot more. Uh, and I work in the IT sector, I'm yeah. an entrepreneur. So yep. some of the talent that we need to hire simply does not exist in this country or even in our vicinity in Europe. Mm. So the kind of signals that this sends out uh, has direct impact on my uh, success as a business. COVID-19 clearly poses a major threat to the global economy, but it seems that Estonia's embrace of the future has made it so well positioned to cope, and it could be an example to us all. Time to reflect on Estonia and what Scotland can learn from this amazing wee country with Peter and Doug. So my name's Peter Ferry. I'm the Honorary Consul for the Republic of Estonia, uh, representing um, the whole of Scotland. Uh, my connection to Estonia started not too long after its uh, re, re independence after the, the fall of the Berlin Wall. I, as a young man working in technology here in Scotland, would go over to Estonia and see the progress that they were making around uh, um, internet access, around uh, the digitalization of government, uh, then the enablement of uh, digital signatures through their um, national identity card. And I would come back to Scotland thinking, hmm, I, w I wonder why we, why we can't get that sort of stuff done over here. Because you've got this kind of brilliant kind of perspective of both I guess through through your wife's family in in, in Estonia the, the very upfront close personal experience of what it's looked like but you've also been living and and you know growing family and life and business here in, in Scotland so how what's your perspective on how Estonia has changed in that kind of emerging sense if you like of nationhood well it, it, it's 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 been an in, a really interesting thing to to watch. I think um, the, right back at the start, the thing that really uh, captured my imagination was the uh, the sense of common purpose that the young nation had. Um, you know, it kind of came out of the shadow of the of Soviet occupation, and that's very much the way it was seen as as the occupation of the country. Um, and uh, the you know, at the time, the, you, you, I'm sure you know the story, the very uh, young first prime minister. And, uh, you know, there was nobody over the age of 35 running anything in Estonia at the time. And uh, and really, there was just a vibrancy, you know, in the same way that now, you know, I'm uh, as an entrepreneur employing young people, you have young people who don't know what's impossible. And um, I suppose we were talking about Linard Wieck back then. He was probably young back then, you know, we've all, we've all aged. But the... Um, the 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 sense of common purpose and the the willingness to to actually try new things and perhaps even the necessity of trying new things was really the thing that, that what, what sparked my imagination you know it became necessary to look at uh, solutions to the problems that they had using what little assets and capital they had available and the the upshot of that is that it's become the the very streamlined easy to live in state that it is today. I had a you know a, a great example of that just in the past couple of days, where we um, we uh, it, here in Scotland I had to deal with some business documentation which involved a few directors' signatures and the and directors of another organisation, and um, we found ourselves in you know sending word documents and having to print them out and sign them with a pen and uh, find find a scanner in the current situation where you know we're all incarcerated in, a, in, a, in our homes and that that process ended up taking in fact it still isn't finished but six days and counting um whereas at the, about the same time we had to uh, agree a, a rental agreement with um a tenant that we have of a flat we have in estonia and and we were able to enact the digital signatures that everybody in estonia uh, has access to in in a matter of minutes to to make that agreement happen and really that's just a little microcosm of how how easy a country it is to to live in and and, and get things done and that kind of maps through to the the uh, the success that its economy has had and the um, 
entrepreneurial basis that that, that it's had in, um, in in having so many successful technology startups. Yeah, I'd just like to introduce uh, Doug Chapman, uh, who is uh, Doug Chapman MP, uh, who has significant experience across a, a range of um, parliamentary groups down in Westminster, and uh, who has a special interest in our, particularly our Arctic neighbours and, and fellow nations, um, and is indeed the Westminster spokesman uh, for the SNP on small business enterprise and innovation. I mean, part of our uh, Westminster group in, uh, down in London, uh, mm -hmm have been tracking Estonia, if you can put it that way, uh, yeah. for some time now, just and see, to see what they, they've been doing uh, as a, a small, successful nation that, as you said, came from the the the, 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 the fallout from the, the Soviet Union. So the, the actual transition uh, couldn't have been very easy in terms of going from a Soviet state, uh, you know, under the probably the, a lot of control from Moscow, yeah. Uh, and, and then you move into a position where you've really got to make your own way in the world and set up the the the, the sort of system of government, I suppose, mm -hmm. uh, to allow you to be successful in the future. So again, just to say that you know we have been looking very closely at um, you know that e, e type society, uh, yeah. in Estonia, uh, and you know I I think where where you've got a, a smaller country as well that maybe on the the scale of Scotland, then you can actually these things are, are much easier to do given the, the scale and I think some of the things we were talking about like a universal uh, basic income for example and I, I think that would be quite quite an easy thing to do in Scotland you know if you control your, your tax and your social security and so on. Uh, in a bigger country maybe within the UK it might be, might be a bit more complicated uh, I don't know what your your view is just on the, the issue of scale do you think that's an important factor? I think um I think scale, uh, the, being being in an environment where you can wrap your arms around it and actually understand all the moving parts. You know, I'm an engineer by training, and I kind of uh, I get that it means that there's there's potentially a less complex system, and you can enact change on that system more more readily. I think the special case in Estonia's case was that they they were kind of starting from a a very um, you know low baseline, and we're, we're able to. Uh, not have to spend too much time considering about considering interruption of existing systems because there just wasn't any you know they were starting from a, a greenfield site i think that um that, that's definitely true what you say in a, a smaller environment you can you can make these changes more rapidly you can also uh you can make a small environment quite complex as well we have a lot of um institutions that you know and in, in making and in, in getting change in uh to happen in scotland can also be be quite complex i'd also observe that the current crisis has um has shown that uh this kind of beneficial change can happen much more rapidly so you know uh whenever when a good crisis happens there's been medical pathways in the nhs that haven't been able to be changed in in, in 30 years that have been changed in three weeks so, uh, so you know, from from that point of view, um, yeah, that coupled with the the small size of Scotland, perhaps it can get uh, some of the agility that, um, that 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 we've seen in Estonia over the past twenty twenty five years. There's been a huge amount of uh, cooperation across the, the European Union, and of course, Estonia is part of that expansion, that economic growth story, as you mm -hmm. say, in the last you know thirty years. Um, is now a fully integrated member of the the European Union, uh, has a seat at the UN. Um, you know, it's, it's actually on the UN Security Council, and, and it's now, I believe, on the UN Security Council. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I learned that this morning. Um, a tremendous, uh, tremendous influence for such a, a small yeah. country who's who that has you know has has been determined to um, take its seat amongst the the leagues of nations and um, and and make its voice heard. Uh, and uh, has behaved, I think, impeccably uh, throughout, whereas uh, other larger nations have uh, have failed to do so. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Although it has um, some, uh, it, it's a small nation. It's uh, very dependent on global trade, so there's a lot of external factors. But in the internal factors that it has control over, there's a long track record of cooperation between government and the private sector to achieve 
uh, good results. The you know the 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 national ID card system has its root in the financial services industry in in, in Estonia. Um, they were able to organise a, um, uh, a a hackathon, hack the crisis within yep. days of the crisis really landing, and it's been a it's a it's a fantastic story which you can have a look at, and um, I, I won't go into here. But um, I think that uh, the that sense of common purpose will serve Estonia well in the in the in the recovery, and, and I think that the signs are that it will it'll be able to uh, react to that really well because uh, you know large and scary neighbours and so on. When 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 uh, faced with existential crises, crises the the nation's been shown that it can it can react and deal with them in the past, and I'm sure it will do again. Just in the in the, the case of recovery, I mean, obviously in in uh, the UK and in Scotland, uh, you know, the government have taken different steps to in order to support um, enterprise and uh, you know different sectors of the economy. Uh, has that been a, a, a similar picture in Estonia? Uh, have, have there been either grants or loans or or special measures being made? Because what we won't really want is our our SMEs or small medium sized enterprises to come through this experience in a at least in a in a position where they can still trade, where they can still carry on their business, where they can still employ people. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, obviously, from our point of view, what I'm seeing locally is that. For a lot of companies, that's that's proven to be a big ask. Uh, I just wondered what the level of support has been in the likes of Estonia. I believe that there has been some support put forward to maintain uh, organisations that weren't able to operate during the crisis for reasons of social distancing and so on. Again, in the tech sector, they have several unicorn level companies who've grown very quickly, um, some of which have, have seen really marked falls in valuation. Uh, since the beginning of the crisis, and I know that there was some um, moves to for the uh, the uh, for the country to take uh, a stake in in some of these organisations to be able to uh, main, maintain them through the crisis. What I would say about Estonia is because um, they they have a near 100% digitalisation of a lot of the of government processes for both citizens and business. That it's very likely that the the, the data is available. To allow that support to be more precisely targeted at, uh, at the at the right organisations according to policy, whereas perhaps here we have to use much more blunt instruments. That for me is one of the big questions: is is that investment into the the digital infrastructure over the last twenty years um, seems to be really paying off now for Estonia, um, because as you say, the the capacity to target support to to even to stitch together the data, there's a there's a there's an open data culture, um, and uh, and so if it, even if it's targeting the right medical support, um, then that seems to be far faster and far easier uh, to do. What do you notice a, a difference in Peter between culturally our approach to the use of personal data and government use of that data versus the Estonian culture towards that? A lot of that's to do with trust in government, mm. and yep. um, the Estonians would um, would uh, s certainly the people I speak to within the public sector claim a very high level of trust in in, in government. But I think um, wh whether or not that's uh, really trust, what I would would say is um, there's certainly a trust in the in the systems that that that, that people use. Um, we. Uh, you know, if you deal with healthcare in the in in Scotland, in the UK, you you're dealing with letters from your doctor and uh, appointment notifications happening through the post. Uh, whereas in Estonia, you know, everybody from eight to eighty is comfortable with going to the health portal and interacting with um, medical practitioners in 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 that way. So uh, I think that um, the there's undoubtedly uh, the state is more empowered. With citizen data, mm -hmm. um, but so far, at least, that's not proven to be uh, such a bad idea because the reduction of friction and the increase in efficiency has uh, has worked out well for your average Estonian citizen. These attitudes can change very quickly. A lot of it depends on you know it's great when your when your administration is um, benign. 
mm-hmm. uh, but you know the, the, these things can uh, yeah. uh, can can change quite quickly. Um, and uh, you know the 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 scare that in Estonia was it was subject to some of the advances that the the more right wing parties made and some of their attitudes around uh, foreign citizens and so on being you know different from the norm. Mm. So uh, you know in that in those situations you, then you you perhaps have cause to to pause and think. Well, you know, is this uh, is the availability of all this information throughout the public sector always going to be a good idea? So I think the um, the, the, the challenge is to enable systems which can give that same friction-free basis for interacting with the state, and um, uh, but still preserve the uh, you know a citizen's control over their own data or, a, or an individual government agency's control over 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 that data. So that's the kind of modern challenge. I think that the the systems that were put in place in Estonia uh, were put in place quite early on, and and the world has. Uh, has moved on, so I think in Scotland we've got the option to to think about um, more nuanced mm. systems which allow uh, allow us to deliver the benefit, to, you know, right from the most vulnerable in society up, um, but still allow the respect for individual privacy and commercial confidence. So, yeah, yeah. But, but your point about the health service is really important as well because mm. you know I think we find in Scotland that, uh, as you said, in, in Estonia as well, you know, quite a lot of the, the country is, is, is rural and maybe a, a, a feels a bit distant from uh, yeah. the, the capital. So, yeah. uh, you know, in terms of delivering health care, for example, in the Western Isles or in the, some little village in the Highlands, then we need to move away from, I think we've moved away from always having to see the doctor because we can see the the, uh, the, the the community nurse or, or something like that to, to, for injections or even to the pharmacy. So mm-hmm. there is a, a movement, but I think there's another step we can take, which is more the the e kind of medicine and mm-hmm. uh, you know um, you know being able to talk directly to somebody about your your health concerns online or whatever. And I think that, that's a good yeah. thing. But yeah. just on the, the the subject of trust as well. Um, again, you might not be 100% um, sure about this one, but uh, our parliament went back this week uh, in terms of a virtual sense. I just wondered in terms of uh, maybe the parliament in, in Tallinn whether that was, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, whether democracy has sort of always been there or whether it's returned uh, through this uh, COVID crisis. Well, I think, you know, you, you can go back, uh, I'm trying to think how many years now, but the, the you know, the, the, in, the, apparatus of parliament of the Rigi Kogu has been digital for for many years I'm actually going to say from uh, probably the uh, probably the uh, mid 90s um, and um, I know I noticed you know we're, we're kind of approaching a, a national election in, in the United States soon you know God knows how that's all going to work um, but in, in Estonia uh, voting online has been possible for some time. I think in the last elections, the the um, uh, people do still like the the drama of actually turning up to the the polling booth. But the um, I think they were close on 50% in the last uh, national elections in Estonia in terms of votes that were that were cast online. So so I think you know uh, the, the 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 these systems being online, it's a key factor for resilience you know the what who who would have thought would be in this position you know at the end of last year even though we knew about what was going on in wuhan who could have would have believed that we'd be um would have 1.5 million people on furlough and uh um you know all all locked in our houses so i think um the a key thing for scotland to learn moving forward is that uh you know it's it's not difficult to there's no there's no technical difficulty in enabling these sorts of things mm-hmm. it's uh it's just really that sense of common yeah. purpose and how you um how you actually erode some of the vested interests and, and actually get the groups talking together so you can so you can you can properly move these things forward it's been fascinating and inspiring talking to some estonian connections estonia is just under a quarter of the size of scotland but in many ways punching way above its weight We've heard about Estonia's seats at the top tables with the EU, the UN and NATO. They're even a member of the UN Security Council. It's clear that Estonia's ongoing investment in technology is vitally important and the wonderful way it supports every aspect of the operation of their country. 
Underpinning all of that is Estonia's positive, purposeful approach to helping make sure that the country continues to try to be the best version of itself in this world. Now that is surely something Scotland can learn from.